Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. I'm Ben Garfinkel, the director of the Center for the Governance of AI. We're a research and field building organization based in Oxford, UK, with a focus on understanding and helping to address risks from advanced AI. I'm very excited for today's seminar, which will focus on a new book co-authored by Drone Asimoglu and Simon Johnson. The book is Power and Progress, Our Thousand-Year Struggle Over Technology and Prosperity. It takes a big picture view of one of the central recurring questions in human history. What determines whether new technology truly serves the interests of the broader public or merely serves the interests of a small elite? The relevance of this question um, is, of course, uh, quite clear when we think about present day discussions of artificial intelligence. And we're honored, of course, to have with us today, Jerome Nasimoglu, who is one of the world's most pathbreaking, influential, and I would say productive economists. He's a professor at MIT, an elected fellow of the National Academy of Sciences and a re recipient of numerous honors, which I, I don't really have time to, to list. His work has played a foundational role in reshaping how many social scientists think about the origins and economic effects of institutions. And his book, The Economic Origins of Dictatorship and Democracies is actually a particular personal favorite of mine. We also have with us Anton Koronek, who will serve as a discussant following um, Drone Asimoglu's presentation. He is a professor of economics at UVA, a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution, and I'm happy to say the economics of AI lead at GovAI. Anton is one of the foremost experts on the potential economic impacts of advanced AI. Um, and then lastly, we have with us Emma Blumke, GovAI's research manager, um, who will moderate much of the discussion today. Um, hopefully we will have time at the end of the discussion for audience Q&A as well. So you can submit your questions at the bottom and also upvote them. And then um, Emma will help to, to process and sort these to lead our discussion at the end. And, and so with those introductions out of the way, I'm happy to jump into the, the presentation. Thank you so much for, for being here, Adrian. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Emma. And thank you, Anton, uh, for uh, organizing this. It's a true pleasure to be here with this audience, which I think is extremely informed uh, and knowledgeable about these issues. But hopefully, I'll be able to share a couple of uh, perspectives that uh, might enrich the discussion or at least challenge it. And it's uh, largely based on my book with Simon Johnson, although I uh, the book was completed before ChatGPT came out. So uh, there is some discussion of generative AI that's, that goes beyond the book as well. And uh, I think I don't need to give a lengthy introduction that leaving some scare stories aside, there is a lot of excitement about AI and generative AI. And a uh, powerful view is that because these tools are going to increase our capabilities, they will ultimately bring benefits one way or another, at least after we've made some adjustments in terms of our institutions, our business organizations, and, and, and perhaps our policies. And in, in some sense, this perspective is what motivates a lot of the book and the reason why we have taken a historical dive is because this time is no different. The same sort of debates have uh, occurred in the past and uh, and the sort of the basic conceptual chain, which many economists take as given, and I think many policymakers as given, is what we call the productivity bandwagon. So technology improves, our capabilities expand and productivity rises, meaning output or whatever measure of value that you have in mind per worker increases. And as a result, there are a bunch of uh, processes that at the end ensure that workers benefit. For example, firms go and want to hire more workers who uh, have now on average higher productivity. But if you look at history, you'll see that there are many examples of truly revolutionary technologies that haven't really had this sort of beneficent effect. And as a result, they haven't taken us anywhere near uh, uh, shared prosperity. So on the left here, I have one example, which is actually a very important breakthrough in medieval agriculture. The dark ages were dark in some ways, but not in terms of technology. There were a lot of new technologies and the windmills stand out. They improved productivity in various tasks by as much as uh, 10, almost 20 fold. But uh, there is no evidence that workers benefited. Why? Because the windmills were completely monopolized by a small group who captured all of the benefits of those. Eli Whitney's cotton gin, uh, well, other people may have invented it before Eli Whitney, but it goes uh, in history books uh, under Eli Whitney's name. Uh, 
it completely transforms the U.S. South uh, from being an economic backwater into one of the most dynamic parts of the world economy, the largest uh, exporter of cotton, which was crucial for the Industrial Revolution. But the workers, the uh, uh, enslaved uh, Black Americans, did not benefit. In fact, their conditions significantly worsened as they were moved deep south and started working longer hours under harsher punishments. So these emphasize the politics of who benefits and who loses because political power matters greatly. This is something we have to bear in mind in AI because AI is not neutral towards political power. But there's another aspect which is as important about what is it that new technologies do? How is it that they improve productivity? And for that, uh, we may... Uh, benefit from revisiting the Industrial Revolution, because the story that uh, you sometimes hear about the Industrial Revolution is, you know, there were uh, some rough times at the beginning, but we are today all so uh, fortunate to be uh, living in a world created by the Industrial Revolution. And that's partly true, but the, there were some rough edges at the beginning, completely understates it. There was nothing automatic about the second phase of the Industrial Revolution that brought uh, productivity growth that was faster, wage growth, uh, more equality, better living conditions. In fact, for about 100 years, uh, the Industrial Revolution uh, created a hellish environment. One part of it was how new technologies improved productivity. And what we see is a focus on automation, meaning uh, machinery was being used for substituting for tasks that were previously performed by humans. As a result, uh, capital owners, factory owners benefited, but workers were sidelined and many of the skilled artisans actually ended up worse off. Uh, but even uh, more jarringly, the new factory system was essentially based on lower wage labor, for example, in, in the area of weaving. And there was no emphasis on creating new productivities for these workers. And uh, in addition, the early factory was a uh, pretty draconian place in terms of uh, how long working days were, the working conditions, and a lot of it was uh, about monitoring. So the this on the left, you may recognize it from the Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon uh, image, uh, famous from Michel Foucault or the Guardians of the Galaxy, whichever was your poison, but uh, nobody actually... In, uh, uh, established a panopticon in workplaces, even though Bentham thought that was going to be a good idea. But a lot of the factories looked like uh, baby versions of panopticon, a lot of monitoring to keep wages low, discipline high, and so on. And in addition, working conditions during the Industrial Revolution uh, were joined with living conditions that were also horrendous. Uh, pollution uh, uh, ep epidemics were rampant, life expectancy in uh, some of the British cities, such as Manchester, may have fallen to as low as 30 at birth, which is just a staggering number. Uh, and all of this, of course, implied that the uh, uh, conditions of the working classes did not improve, in fact, may have materially uh, worsened during the first 100 years. Uh, our best estimates suggest that real incomes of workers remain constant. Their working hours increased by about 20% and their health and working condition uh, and living conditions deteriorated quite significantly. I'll come back to what uh, caused a turnaround because I think it's relevant for today. But before I do that, uh, I want to just fast forward all the way to the last four decades to make the argument that all of this is not just economic history for economic history's sake. There are lessons because there are some, not perfect, but there are some parallels. And in fact, this picture, uh, which depicts the evolution of real wages by 10 demographic groups, or men and women different uh, separately, and then all the way from workers with less than a high school degree in the United States in orange to workers with a postgraduate degree in dark blue. And, uh, and it shows both the reason why the current times are very different. In the 1950s, here I'm starting in 1960 and uh, normalizing it to zero so you can follow the, from 1960 onwards the evolution. You see the sort of the, the period of shared prosperity here. These 10 curves are tracking each other pretty closely up to the mid 1970s and they're growing very fast, about two and a half percent a year uh, in real terms every year. But that shared prosperity comes to an end sometime around 1980, 
From then on, you see much larger levels of inequality, both among men and women. But even more jarringly, you see significant declines in the real hourly wages and real annual incomes of, uh, of low education workers. Those with a high school degree in brown, less than a high school degree are really experiencing, oh, sorry, this was uh, the brown is a, those with associate degrees, such as community colleges and two-year colleges and green is in high school uh, graduates, you see quite significant decline in their real earnings. So this picture then uh, frames the discussion in two different ways before we come to the age of AI. What was it that enabled this shared prosperity, which goes back all the way to the beginning of the 19th to the 20th century in some ways, and in fact, the second half of the 19th century, but we see its strongest form in the post-war decade. And then how did it break down? Uh, and uh, this is sort of US specific to some degree. You don't see declines in the real earnings of low income workers to the same extent in other countries, but inequality has increased in much of the industrialized world and uh, earnings for low education workers are stagnant or declining in several countries. So to understand uh, the big picture, then we have to sort of think about how is it that the second phase of the British Industrial Revolution was different? What were the seeds of the shared prosperity that started being uh, uh, sown in the in the second half of the 19th century and, and, and also continuing in the first half of the 20th century and even more powerfully in uh, since 1945? And uh, one place where you can understand some aspects of it uh, from an illustrative point of view is the Ford Motor Factory, because Ford was a leader in uh, automation, the new electrical machinery with from decentralized sources uh, used for advanced uh, new uh, equipment that completely changed car production, made it much more modular, much more lower cost, enabled mass production. Those were absolutely critical, but also Ford's factory epitomizes that it wasn't just automation. At the same time as automation was ongoing, there were a whole host of production and non-production new tasks that were being introduced. It's no accident that in most of the pictures that you see from the Ford factory, you will see the workers. They're engaged in technical tasks that are very different from what uh, uh, workers used to perform in the 19th century factories. They are uh, taking on new tasks, including uh, you know, dealing with this advanced machinery, inspection, design, quality control. And then this is all overseen by a whole host of clerical tasks that become a hallmark of the modern manufacturing factory. So it's the creation of these new tasks for labor that then underpins wage growth and in fact, employment growth, uh, as opposed to some of the recent episodes of automation when output increases go hand in hand with employment declines as output was increasing for the auto industry uh, 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 <clears throat> increased in size tenfold in terms of its employment as well. But it wasn't just uh, new tasks counterbalancing automation. The uh, the trap that the medieval technologies and the uh, uh, cotton gin exemplifies, which is output increases, but all power is in the hands of uh, uh, capital owners or, or, or managers, you know, that was also avoided in the auto industry because auto industry was also uh, one of the leaders of worker organizations. This is one of the emblematic strikes, the sit-down strike of the GM factory in 1937. But workers started becoming better organized, especially after New Deal. And uh, that organization was part of uh, what led to improved working conditions, higher wages uh, that kept in pace with the increases in, uh, in productivity. Now, this discussion also frames why things started going on after 1980. First of all, uh, we continued to automate, and that's a good thing, but we did just automate to some degree. So there was too much focus on automation and not creating, not enough on creating new tasks. This is now how a, a modern car factory looks like with the fancy robots, but what you don't see are the workers. So uh, there are exceptions to this in the Japanese and German uh, auto factories, but in uh, the United States and several other countries, automation, for example, in the, in blue color tasks went hand in hand with sidelining of the workers rather than creating new tasks. And then these new worker, these workers losing their tasks were at the at the at the center of the wage inequality. One way of seeing that comes from my work with Pasquale Restrepo. So this chart is. Uh, 
will take a few minutes, uh, two minutes to explain, but I think it's worth it because it provides a, uh, uh, a an easy summary of a lot of the work we did. So on the horizontal axis, I have the change in real wages from 1980 to 2016. So that period, this period that I showed you earlier on, where inequality starts increasing uh, and some groups are declining, have, have declining real wages. So rather than showing it year by year, I'm showing you the cumulative change from the beginning of this period, 1980, to the end. Uh, and instead of the 10 demographic groups, I have more dem detailed demographic groups distinguished by education, gender, experience, and ethnicity. And the color coding, again, tells you what the education level of these groups are. You can see, just like in that picture, that many of these dots are below the zero. So those are the, all the groups, come, some of them very large, as shown by the size of the circle, that experience significant declines in their real wages since 1980. But the key is the horizontal axis. Horizontal axis is a measure of how much automation the tasks that that group used to perform uh, has been subject to. Namely, it is the fraction of the tasks that a demographic group used to perform in 1980s, which have since then been automated. You can see for some groups that have high education, for example, postgraduates and graduates, that's essentially zero. But for some of the middle and low education groups, it's as high as 25, even 30%. But what's remarkable about this picture is that it shows that there's a very strong and we argue in our work, I'm not going to go into the details, causal relationship between automation and, and, and wage changes. And this explains about 70%, 60 to 70% of the uh, of the beginning picture that I showed you. But it wasn't only automation being the focus, it was also institutional changes that shifted the distribution of power. And that was both because what we call the visions of companies change, which is what their priorities, what they found acceptable, Part of it uh, is epitomized by this famous economist, Milton Friedman, uh, who powerfully argued that the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits and only to increase its profits. And in particular, what that meant to Friedman is, you know, businesses were free to cut wages in order to benefit shareholders, uh, as well as other, other things that may be more questionable. And anybody who was going to be the best candidate for resisting that, which are the labor unions, were already in decline and then got another big uh, uh, push down in 1980 when Ronald Reagan fired all of the professional air traffic controllers during their strike and uh, and, and 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 the private sector sort of uh, followed suit. Ford, for example, was no friend of organized labor, but the general view among business people like Ford is that you had to share the benefits. Uh, uh, if you were going to keep your workers and your workers gonna, were going to remain productive. And, and it also was good for uh, industrial peace because unions were always around the corner. Well, in this new age, the view was, well, you don't have to keep your workers happy. After all, you have all these automation machinery to replace them, and there is no countervailing powers to resist you. Now, all of this is pre-AI or pre-generative AI. Why should we pay much attention to that? Well. There is no uh, uh, there's no news to this audience that there are transformative changes going on with uh, generative AI. But what makes this a particularly important time to worry about these issues is that there is a critical decision about the direction of AI. And in particular, the uh, argument that I'm going to make is that we can push AI more and more in the automation direction, thus amplifying the trends that I showed you. But there is an also an alternative, which sometimes is discussed, which uh, I would call pro-worker or pro-human AI. We already have a proof of concept for this from a number of recent papers uh, from the GitHub co-pilot of Microsoft, uh, my, uh, our students at MIT, Shket Noy and Whitney Jang, which did an online experiment, Brynja Lufsen et al., for a customer service, where if you use large language models uh, or generative AI tools as a complement to workers to provide them information, that can uh, actually increase their productivity and can actually help workers with the lowest levels of expertise. For example, those who know how to write uh, basic simple tasks, but they're not the best at that. And in fact, that fits the a, a mental model that you should have of the prospects of generative AI, which is that I think the best use of generative AI is an information retrieval filtration curation tool. What I, what I mean by that is that 
you know, uh, in many, many occupations today, uh, what we are doing is a series of problem solving. It's more and more complex human decision maker. It's not just office jobs. If you're an electrician, you have a whole series of problem solving decision making tasks. And uh, many of those problems are new challenging, but there is a lot of relevant information for that. It's all out in the internet or in the minds of other people or in some academic publications. But we have complete paucity, complete scarcity of usable information because we don't know how to take that information in real time and apply it to the specific problem at hand. So the real promise of generative AI is as an information retrieval, you take that information, filtration, you find what's the right part of that information for the question at hand, and you curate it, meaning you present it to the human in a way that's easily actable upon. So if you do that, I think these types of proof of concepts can become scaled and become a reality. But what I'm going to argue now controversially, since uh, I think there are many people here who are uh, very knowledgeable about this industry, is that the we are not going in that direction and we are very unlikely to go in that direction without a course correction. It comes from the structural factors that I have identified earlier on. Incentives for businesses to cut costs and automation is very valuable to them. Lack of countervailing powers and imbalance of power in workplaces, but also it is being boosted by the uh, approach in the industry about what AI is about. And in fact, I would say from the very beginning, there were two visions of AI. And the industry today, I think, is much closer to one of them. The first one, which is even more famous, which is uh, just a part of proof of concept for me that it is much more famous, is the one that goes to Alan Turing, autonomous machine intelligence machine designed to be smarter and more powerful than most humans, except for those who are designing or proving the theorems. And this vision inexorably leads to a bias towards automation, because if you are going to have these machines that have this autonomous machine intelligence, meaning capabilities, and uh, and also couple that with the view that humans are often not so good at their tasks, why not uh, use these machines more and more to perform human tasks? Why not set uh, reaching human parity as the metric for success? And this was the view uh, that was implicit in Alan Turing. It became much more explicit in the uh, historic Dartmouth project, which christened AI, which many of you knew. But from the very beginning, there was a very different vision, which I find much more inspiring. Uh, it goes back to MIT's Norbert Wiener, uh, JCR Licklider, or Douglas Engelbar, which in the book we call the machine usefulness or pro-human AI, which is that it's not that you want machines to be autonomous or intelligent. What you want from the machines is to, for them to be useful. And if you think about the production structure, for them to be useful, it is essential that they help workers. Uh, automation can be part of the usefulness, but unless you help workers, you help humans become better, you're not going to achieve this. And in fact, if you go back to the history of computer science, you'll see that some of the ma many inspiring things, uh, including hypertext, hyperlinks, mouse, uh, many of the visual uh, screen-driven uh, things came out of this vision. But today, I think we have become completely beholden to the machine intelligence, autonomous machine intelligence vision. Uh, and actually, and I think Anton will uh, disagree with some of this, I think there is a structural weakness to this machine intelligence part that it often disappoints in terms of productivity growth, because at the end, we tend to overestimate how good the machine is going to be and how bad the humans are, so we overestimate the productivity gain. Often the flexibility of human intelligence is underappreciated. And when you give that up, you get a lot of problems. Let me skip that. But let me make one other point and then conclude, which is that the reason why I emphasized politics so much from the beginning is because, you know, who holds power not only determines which vision becomes uh, activated, but it also determines how we use the technologies uh, who is more likely to capture the gains and so on. And in this context, you cannot think of AI just as a production technology. AI is also an information control technology. And it is no surprise that one of the major areas of growth with AI is surveillance. Uh, for example, with the Chinese government, these are, this is the uh, social credit system uh, readers that you need to uh, get permission before you buy your ticket, train tickets, for example. But uh, even though Facebook and Google may look very different from the Chinese Communist Party, you know, the U.S. tech sector has, has all, also a lot in the business of information collection and control. And we don't know where AI is going to go, how imbalanced 
power is going to be in politics, in workplaces, in the industrial organization. And I think that's something to really worry about. And social media already gives us a glimpse of some of the things that could go wrong. Well, if you uh, are at least partly uh, concerned that about our direction, but also, like me, think that an alternative direction is feasible, uh, then the question is whether we can actually reach it. And in the book, we actually go into quite a bit of detail on this. We say you first have to start changing the narrative, and in particular, change the narrative away from the desirability of top-down schemes towards greater voices and technology choices, not just, you know, more people doing different things with technology, but also society having ways of transmitting its views of what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, what is desirable. And in particular, I think that's particularly important in the area of what's going to happen with labor, what's going to happen with inequality, what's going to happen with jobs. And that is an institutional problem or, or, or a politics problem. So in the past, that sort of uh, political uh, process was achieved by government regulation, civil society organization. Before he became a third party candidate, Ralph Nader was a uh, was one of the most creative uh, civil society organizer. It came from the labor unions. None of this is very active today. Government is completely unable and or unwilling to regulate tech, and civil society organizations have less their lost their vigor, and labor organizations have become much less powerful. But the uh, the vision that not just Wiener, Engelbart, Lichleider, but people like this, Ted Nelson, captured, which is that it is actually feasible to get computer power to the people, is possible, but it does require institutional change, social change, as well as redirecting technological change away from autonomous machine intelligence and the obsession with reaching artificial general intelligence to doing machine usefulness. And of course, some of you will say, you know, that's even crazier than the beginning of the talk, because how could the government or even civil society organizations redirect technological change? Well, here is one example of how they do it. Even a modicum of government regulation uh, and civil society pushback completely transformed the energy sector in the United States and in other countries as late as to, as recently as 2010. Uh, solar photo offshore wind were about 10 times as expensive. Uh, everybody knew about climate change, but nobody was doing anything about it. Uh, and uh, and and as with a small amount of pushback from civil society, we've had an explosion in patents that are directed at solar offshore and onshore wind and tremendous improvements in productivity. And today, these renewables are cost competitive with fossil fuels. I think what's done, what was done in the energy sector can be done in the production and also control of information for creating a more pro-human direction of AI. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now I'll welcome Anton to um, also present his comments and then we'll lead into a discussion in Q&A. And just as a reminder to all the audience, um, you can upvote uh, questions in the Q&A section and, and submit your own as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darren, for first for writing this uh, fantastic book and also for joining us for this interesting presentation. Uh, I'll start with what I liked most about the book. So first, uh, and you know, I have to add, Darren and I were both economists, and for economists, uh, this is not the traditional way of thinking, but emphasizing the role of power and institutions in shaping technology's impact is really crucial. And I think uh, Darren really makes some very visionary contributions there. Uh, the book also points out the dangers we are facing from the current trajectory of AI. And uh, I largely agree with uh, most of the dangers depicted. Uh, it is concerned about a small vision oligarchy, uh, as Darren sometimes call it, setting the agenda. And it raises uh, a lot of important issues in areas as uh, far apart as taxation and antitrust. Um, now, my job as a discussant is to also make some critical comments. And what I want to start with is uh, I want to disentangle that term techno-optimism that Darren uses uh, throughout uh, into kind of two separate aspects. And I think the kind of traditional techno-optimist perspective 
uh, expects that there will be high a high speed of technological progress, and in addition, predicts that progress will automatically lead to good outcomes. That's why it's optimist, right? Um, now, in some sense, the book is kind of directed of making the case against techno-optimism. Um, but I'll say I myself and a lot of the people, uh, I'm sure, uh, here at Gaffey I, uh, expect one, uh, but are very concerned about the issues related to point two. So in other words, I expect a very high speed of progress going forward, but I'm extremely worried about the outcomes that this will lead to. Uh, so uh, does it make me a techno-optimist? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, I only subscribe to basically one part of the premise. Uh, and uh, I actually really believe the opposite on the other part. So um, the book uh, makes a convincing case against uh, what I want to call techno-fatalism, that we should just let technology proceed and we can't really do very much. Um, but I also want to say that the alternative that it paints is inspiring, but may be bordering on the naive. So on an, in an ideal world, I would agree with everything that is proposed in the book, but in practice, the described uh, kind of first best, as we call it in economics, uh, may not be attainable. And I'll make uh, an analogy that is familiar to everybody. Uh, in an ideal world, the ideas of Marxism uh, are uh, really good, right? We would all be equal. We uh, own the means of production uh, in a shared manner and so on. But of course, we know uh, from historical experience uh, that it is not compatible with the way that humanity works. I'll also make a technological analogy. Uh, maybe, we obviously don't know, but maybe uh, artificial intelligence uh, with respect to AGI, artificial general intelligence, is at a similar stage as uh, nuclear energy in the early 1940s, where uh, essentially the basic ideas were out. And uh, if you told Oppenheimer, uh, you know, you really shouldn't do this, and maybe even if you convinced him, at that point in history, it was going to happen, and there wasn't very much uh, that could be uh, really done about it anymore. Uh, so I think just like techno-fatalism is flawed, the idea that any system of governance, uh, whether that is a democracy, a social planner, can exert absolute control over the direction of technology is flawed. Um, and the way I think about it is that ultimately, humanity and our human culture, including our technological path, are the products of evolutionary forces. We know evolution involves uh, a lot of uncoordinated processes, a lot of stuff happening. And uh, I hope, uh, as Darren does, that there are many places where we can uh, positively interact uh, with that process and where we can make a positive difference. But at the same time, there will be things that are happening and that are kind of, um, I guess, unstoppable at this point. So um, arguing for techno-realism, uh, what I want to propose is that if we are in search of solutions, being as realistic as possible always works best. And if we have too rosy of a picture uh, of the world, or also too pessimistic of a picture of the world, that's not aligned with realism. And that means our solutions won't be the best ones that we can come up with. So I thought the best way to read this book is as an inspiring, kind of a little bit utopian guide for how to aim for a better technological future. Uh, but, uh, you know, as, as a parent uh, of two children, for example, I would feel better about our future if Darren focused on a plan B to power and progress as well. And wh why do I say that? Well, for, for anybody on the call who doesn't know that, uh, Darren is perhaps the closest thing to a super intelligence that's currently in existence. And if he uh, 
struggles with the problems uh, that we are facing uh, with AI. And if he comes up with solutions, that's kind of one of our best hopes uh, for tackling this problem. So I personally uh, think that one of the most fruitful avenues for how to steer AI going forward is to assume that progress will be very fast in the next few years, that the genie can't be put back into the bottle anymore, and that we will have some control over how and where to put the powers of greater intelligence to use, but not absolute control. And if we kind of start with that premise, maybe some of the solutions that we would propose will be less, um, um, how should I say, less ambitious, but perhaps have a greater chance of success. And um, so uh, I asked Claude uh, what it would propose uh, in terms of uh, how to reframe the book with the perspective of preparing society for transformative AI happening faster and happening perhaps sooner than um, envisioned by the book. And these are the points that Claude proposed. First, a pause or slowdown is unrealistic. It overstates the current risk. I'm not sure I agree with that, but it underemphasizes the upsides. Perhaps uh, fixation on jobs uh, is unhelpful. I will come to that in a moment. Uh, it's a bit vague on the governance uh, solutions and so on. Um, I'll send it to Darren afterwards. Um, now, on this last point uh, of scenarios for labor, I think Darren and I both agree on the desirability of steering progress to benefit workers. But I also want to point out that work is a means to an end and not an end in itself. And if AI advances really fast, and again, we don't know yet, then our production possibilities and our utility possibilities, meaning our scope for making everybody happier, would expand vastly. And it would be really inefficient, and I almost want to say immoral, to force people to work to make a living in that kind of world. But at the same time, it would pose really tremendous institutional challenges. We would have to develop an alternative system of income distribution and, as I have learned from Darren, of power distribution. And I think that would be one of the most important economic dimensions of AI alignment that we are facing. So um, thank you again for writing this book, Darren. And if I may start the kind of discussion now with two questions, my first one would be, uh, what if AI advances much faster uh, than you envisioned uh, when you were writing the book and we can't do anything about that? And my second question would be specifically about scenarios for labor. If technology becomes kind of really capable, if it's not just so-so, but if AI delivers incredible productivity gains uh, and we can share that among people without having to work the 40 hours a week that most people have to work today. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Those are excellent comments and very kind as usual. Uh, let me actually give very quick answers to your questions so that we can open up for, for discussion. I think in terms of uh, the, the, the one thing that uh, is very important from your, or well, many things important, but one thing that's uh, particularly important from your discussion is what is our room for redirecting technological change? Meaning, is there really a possibility for changing the direction and how malleable technology is. And you're absolutely right. Not everything is perfectly malleable, but part of the reason why I went through, you know, the, the view of how we can use generative AI as for information retrieval, filtration, and curation is because that's actually quite a feasible thing. You know, it's completely within the existing technological know-how to create tools for teachers, for example, that they can do much more individualized education 
or for electricians so that they can troubleshoot by taking pictures of the specific circuit that they're having problems with and then they find uh, use cases that are similar. So those are not you know, dreams. Those technologies can be developed, but that's not where we are putting the emphasis. We're putting the emphasis on more and more data collection, you know, the tremendous amount of billions of dollars the industry is, uh, you know, putting is, uh, you know, is, is multi-purpose. But if you look at Microsoft, you see where they think a lot of the monetization is going to come from. It's going to come from individualized ads. That's why Bing versus Google search is so important. And there's also a tremendous, tremendous uh, effort towards artificial general intelligence, because even things that don't look like artificial general intelligence are motivated by creating these very high level capabilities. So I think diverting some of that effort uh, towards things that are more useful for humans, that's what I'm talking about. But then uh, in terms of your question, what if A, that's not feasible, and B, AI advances much faster? You know, uh, I'll tell you two answers to that question. First of all, I don't believe the I believe that AI is very generative AI is impressive. I believe that there will be a lot of resources and there will be steady progress, but I do not believe that we're going to get anything close to the types of productivity gains that some people are talking about. And the reason for that, and that's why the two types of techno optimism, thank you for that disentanglement, that's very useful. But the two types of techno optimism in my mind are a little bit linked is because I think when we think of automation, we tend to underestimate human creativity, flexibility, situational knowledge, and all sorts of things that humans are involved in, in a range of tasks. I think those are going to be very difficult to automate. And that's why productivity gains, you know, they're going to happen, but they're not going to be super fast. But even if I ignore all of those misgivings that I have and I say, okay, imagine we're going to have these tremendous advances in AI and everybody is going to be jobless. Uh, because, you know, AI is going to do everything better than humans, you know, can we find policy solutions to make this a better world? I don't think so. Because I don't think the issue is just a simple one of redistribution so that we get better consumption. I think if we have a world in which a small group of people design and control algorithms, algorithms do everything, that's a very dystopian society because a very large fraction of the population becomes completely dispensable. They become second second class citizens par excellence. If you give them UBI, that's even worse because that just uh, uh, institutionalizes their second class citizenship. And that's the reason why, you know, of course, uh, if we have a very unequal society and, you know, what's wrong with universal basic income, I would be in favor of that. But I am against UBI precisely because it accepts that two class society. And moreover, I don't think that's the power going back to the power. I don't think we would ever create a UBI or a social safety net that's really even close to fair because look at it today, uh, the multi-billionaires are doing their best in order to thwart even the smallest amount of redistribution or leveling the playing type field type of policies. You know, if you make them much more powerful, both with their control of AI and with their even bigger wealth, I don't think we're going to have the political process to create any type of appropriate redistribution system. And even if we created it, that status hierarchy, that two class society would remain. So that's very dystopian. But fortunately, I don't think we are going to be there anytime soon or during the my lifetime or my children's lifetime. So we have a lot of time to redirect technological change, but it has to start soon. Mm -hmm. Um, that answer, unfortunately, doesn't make me uh, feel better about the future. It makes me more worried, if anything. <laughs> but thank you very much uh, for sharing that with us. Um, so uh, I think, Emma, would you like to uh, ask uh, the questions uh, that we got in the Q&A? Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much, both of you. We have actually 16 questions in the Q&A. And... Um, Audience, just to let you know, keep on upvoting. They're uh, switching rapidly and which ones are the most popular. <laughs> um, uh, Darren, you just mentioned that, you know, we kind of are at a critical time. We have to move quickly to actually shape this trajectory. Um, and a lot of these questions actually overlap. So there's a lot of questions about how much influence can we actually have over which path we take here? How optimistic are you about our power to influence those paths? Um, and another like also to get into specifics, like who do you see 
Like, which specific le levers are you seeing as the most promising for the, actually the time that we're in right now? Perfect questions. And and look, I I think uh, I have to cling to the hope that it is feasible because I think it is technically feasible and there's nothing socially that makes it impossible, but it is a tall order. So I accept that. And because, you know, we are at a particular juncture where corporate incentives are very much aligned with automation. The tech industry is the sort of, I think, uh, is, is in a mindset that supports that because of the emphasis on machine intelligence, uh, you know, autonomous general, I mean, artificial general intelligence and, uh, and the current path of AI, which is all about large companies collecting a lot of data, and civil society and labor organizations are weak. But I think change in all of these is feasible. I think the corporate world is uh, engaged in some sort of soul searching that we haven't seen for the last 50 years. You know, the business roundtable, which was like the biggest uh, advocate of the Friedman Doctrine, saying, you know, don't know, corporate responsibility is very important and you have to take in the environment and the workers into account. Uh, I think when I talk to people from the tech industry who are not at the very top, but at the next layer, there's a lot of uh, concern about what the implications of these new technologies are. There are a lot of different ideas. So I think there's a hunger within the tech industry for greater sort of ethical responsibility. It won't come, it won't arise by itself and it won't arise under the current leadership that we're seeing of the large companies, but it, it is there. And I think... Uh, what we are seeing over the last few years is that civil society organizations are are, are rebounding. No, I don't think there was another question I glimpsed uh, uh, briefly. Labor organizations, as they are today, I don't think are up to the task, both for institutional reasons that makes uh, bargaining at the establishment level in the United States or so sectoral broader bargains with bigger mandates are not possible. Labor organizations are quite backward looking. I've been talking to a lot of labor leaders, but you know, only a few of them are really... Uh, up to date with understanding what the new world in terms of AI and other technologies is going to mean for their membership. But but again, I think things can change. And uh, we've seen, you know, breakneck paced changes in values and priorities uh, during critical periods. And I think we are in the midst of one of those critical periods. So yes, I think Anton is right. And I think that question is right. This is difficult, but it's far from impossible. You, you just mentioned uh, unions and a few other solutions, but actually there's one question on data unions and someone is wondering whether you believe yeah. data unions are a feasible way to share prosperity with broader society. Oh, well, thank you very much for raising that because I'm, uh, I think data unions are very important. I do not believe that they are by themselves going to be uh, a major step towards shared prosperity because of their direct effects. But I think they are a very, very important part for several reasons. The first one is that, you know, the current equilibrium where data is, you know, essentially expropriated by a large language model, and that's where a lot of their wisdom comes from, I think is unfair and it's not workable because, uh, you know, these models are going to destroy their own data. Uh, if you don't sort of protect data, I think people are not going to produce the high quality data that's so important. And I think availability of data for free creates all sorts of other incentives that are sort of very important uh, for the future of the technology. So I think uh, the type of vision that I was trying to outline requires a lot of domain expertise, but that requires a lot of high quality data. And you know, you're know, you never gonna get that from Reddit, but having the Reddit data makes people wanna, why, why don't we try to uh, get these models sound even more like humans? But that's not where you're gonna get the, you know, if I'm an electrician and I want advice, I don't care whether it sounds like humans, or not, again, artificial general intelligence gets us lost, but I want reliable information. So the type of data is gonna be very important, but just having individual data rights is not workable because uh, first of all, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an administrative nightmare, but even more importantly, data is very substitutable. So if you have my data, that reduces your value of acquiring Anton's data and reduces Anton's value of protecting his data. So individual data prices would create a race to the bottom. 
So that's why data unions are very important. And then if you follow this logic, it suggests that if you have the right sort of data unions, it will actually change the incentives in the industry towards more pro-human AI, better treatment of the data, better treatment of information, more democratic use of information. So I think uh, the indirect effects of data unions are the ones that I'm really excited about. Those are great, great comments. I, I agree on all the points about data. Um, so a uh, contrasting opinion to some of the things that we've discussed today is the another worldview where um, essentially unemployment due to you know heavy adoption of technologies could actually be a very desirable outcome. Uh, do you have any comments for because th that's that can be a very popular opinion as well. Um, do you have any comments for you know if it is a world where we have great abundance and leisure and freedom to choose how we spend our time? Uh, how do you view those opinions? Well, again, I, I I disagree with that. First of all, I think uh, and, you know this, to do this, we need a much deeper dive into philosophy than uh, philosophers of AI have fully undertaken. But I think a very important part is you know how people define themselves and what they view their contribution to society is. So if you get rid of work, you have to find another contribution. And I think for you know eight billion people, that's going to be very difficult for how they self-identify. And, uh, and 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 what they do in order to feel to be valued and also uh, for the society to value them. That's very different. For example, technological advances and institutional changes make us work less hours because we choose to do so. We're productive, but we change the balance between, say, work and family. That's very different from people losing their job. And the evidence from very different uh, types of uh, corners is that when people lose their jobs, where communities don't find enough jobs, that becomes really, really uh, depressing. And that's true in places, not just like the United States where the social safety net is weak, but even in places where social safety net is strong. There's a very interesting uh, experimental paper from the Rohingya uh, refugees in the Cox's Bazaar where people are offered work and transfer payments. And these are very, this is a very poor population. And what the, what the study finds is that, you know, when people are given work, uh, it's much better for their mental health, for their happiness, than giving the same amount. And when they're given the choice between transfer and work, uh, they are willing, even though they're very poor, they're willing to take 30% pay cut so that they can work and get that payment rather than they just get it as a pure transfer. So, you know, of course, it's one particular population. People have done it in Africa, similar studies. They find similar results. But I think there is an important thing that people have to feel like they're contributing to society. Work may not be the only way of doing it, but for so far, we don't have an alternative to that. I want to jump in here for a moment. And I think it's certainly true that our current society is very much organized around labor being the primary mechanism of distributing income. And maybe for... Uh, I want to see people like Darren and me, uh, we are already so hardwired to think about it that way that it will be hard to change. Uh, but, uh, you know, Keynes wrote an essay, Economic Possibilities of Our Grandchildren. Uh, let me say of our children and maybe our children's generation uh, won't have to be brought up that way. And uh, I think you can already see a little bit of a change in attitudes towards work in the younger generations. And perhaps we will need that change in attitudes uh, if we really see uh, these phenomenal technological advances that some of us are predicting. And again, uh, we don't know how fast this is going to develop. And, that is that um, is a possibility, Anton, but let me now sw swap places for you. Okay. I like the evolutionary perspective when it comes to technology, but I wouldn't overdo it when it comes to technology. But I think the evolutionary perspective when it comes to social engineering, I am much more firmly on board with that. So I think our ability to guess how we can change people's preferences is, is very, very limited. And I think many schemes in history when people thought, oh, we can change people's preferences haven't worked very well. So I don't know whether we can really socially engineer as a generation that is mentally healthy uh, understand its self-worth and defines it via things that don't all have anything to do with production or other work-related activities. I don't know the answer to that, but I'm 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 concerned. I agree with the social engineering part, and that's why I'm saying maybe for us we can't change that anymore. But as younger folks grow up into a world 
in which technology is much more powerful, maybe that will naturally evolve in that direction. But yeah, we will have to see. I'll hand it back to Emma again. That actually, that leads perfectly to one of the most upvoted questions, actually, uh, which realistically, th these are cultural questions. Every every different state, every every like even different groups and different cultures are going to have a completely different attitude towards the adoption of these things. Um, how do you see essentially if, if we have you know international co uh, competition? It, it, and, and you know these are these are uh, AI being developed in in private. Uh, companies that it's an in, these are international things if how do you actually see the adoption of these things playing out if, if we don't actually agree amongst different com, uh, countries what we should oh, do oh that's such a fantastic question i think you know the fact that we are in a decentralized world is both a blessing and a curse i think the curse uh, the blessing part is related to what anton just mentioned you know uh we can experiment with different ways of taking these ai opportunities or not taking the ai opportunities I actually think we should have used that decentralization and the federal structure much more before, you know, uh, ChatGPT was rolled out to the whole world. So we should have experimented with, you know, what happens if we get ChatGPT to different schools and see how they, how the students and the teachers react, and then perhaps we can learn about how to build guardrails. So I think there's a lot more room for doing that. Uh, but on the curse side, of course, these units are not independent; they're all blended together. And mistakes in one translates into mistakes in, in others. And the incentives are going to be, and this is again going back to the industrial structure of the tech industry with venture capital playing a very important role and market share being playing a very important role. You know, those are cre gonna create the worst kinds of incentives. Put on top of that, you know, China. China has a very specific uh, bias in how it develops these technologies and how it wants to control these technologies. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of resources being or, for example, towards monitoring, censorship, surveillance technologies. But you also see the interdependence nature of the world. Just Huawei itself has exported uh, surveillance technologies to over 60 non-democratic countries around the world. So uh, so, so that that interdependence is, is a curse as well. But on the other hand, to end on an uplifting tone or note, uh, actually it can be leveraged to be a positive as well. If say the European Union and the United States jointly start uh, a sort of a regulatory regime that is respectful of human rights and uh, data rights, and also takes the other broader social implications into account, I think that will influence the rest of the world, including China. I think that's all the questions that we have time for today, but thank you so much for this discussion. Um, we actually will um, be saving all the questions that were asked in the Q&A section. Uh, we can circulate it. Perhaps we'll put together um, some sort of a blog post answering the most uh, popular questions later on. Um, this really, you know, it, it introduced more questions than, than we could cover. So thank you so much for your time and thank you everyone for listening. Thanks, Anton. Thank you very much, thank Anton. You, thank you, Emma and Ben. This was a true pleasure. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. Bye-bye.